So how do you actually use the genetic algorithm for applications? Um, well, one example is in the classification example that I talked about before, right? Where you could, for instance, use the GA to generate coefficients for attributes, then develop a simple linear model that classifies that. And you can even think about this in the all state example, for instance, right? We could imagine that we could order the coverage levels from one to five, and then we could take all the attributes and we could encode into the genome a weighting on those attributes. And so then in the evaluation function, we would simply take that weighting, multiply it times that attribute, and see what coverage level it predicts. Now that's not the best example because it doesn't allow for the fact that there's a bunch of nonlinearity in that space, there's a bunch of interesting properties. So we might think of a better way to encode that problem. And you could think about maybe it just is choosing which attributes to use, right? Or just choosing how they might be combined instead. Um, and you can get to more advanced cases like genetic programming, which can combine them in whole new ways and combine actual pieces of code on them, right? And that would be a fantastic way to explore that space. As a result of all this, genetic algorithms has been applied in a wide variety of areas. For instance, when I was at Michigan State, we used genetic algorithms to help design parts for uh, automobiles, uh, like flywheels in cars, right? So that they would have the best possible properties because engineers didn't know necessarily which ones would be able to spin the fastest and still withstand the most uh, speed without breaking apart. And so we used them in that space. They've uh, been developed circuits and antennas that actually were better than circuits and antennas that had been designed by um, humans, right? So they were able to receive more information or work over longer distances. And they developed interesting and different ways of doing that. They've been used to control robots, right? And so one of the cool aspects I like is a, a friend of mine uh, did some work where he basically showed that you could use evolutionary computation to make robots more adaptable, where if you damage one of their legs, they could adapt to that and still be able to walk, right, in the situation that they were in. Uh, bioinformatics, right? So hearing aids have used genetic algorithms to tune the properties of the hearing aids, right? So that they better work for uh, the people who are actually wearing them, right? Rather than having them preset for all individuals. Uh, they've been used to study the actual physical process of evolution, They've been used to study the actual, you know, real economics, right? And try to understand how uh, stock markets work. Uh, they've been used to calibrate complex simulation. So one thing that's interesting, if you imagine a big complex model, like a model of the whole U.S. economy, right? There's probably a lot of parameters in there that you don't know the exact value of. And so one thing GAs have done is been used very well is for to try and calibrate those parameters by fitting the data that they've seen in the past. Um, and of course, that brings up the question and begs the question, why do GAs work in the first place, right? John Holland advocated something called the building block hypothesis. Essentially, if you encode your genome correctly, if you construct it correctly, so that parts of the problem that are relevant to each other are near each other in the genome, then the crossover operation is essentially going to combine those building blocks, those small order short link solutions to find a better and better solution over time. Uh, different individuals in GA will have different building blocks and crossover will result in that merger. You can imagine like a very simple example of this, that if I have a wheel as one of my building blocks, and I have an engine as one of my building blocks, I can combine them to create a car, right? And so in some cases, intuitively, this makes sense. Another way to think of it is that GAs are solving the exploration versus exploitation problem. Uh, this is a classic problem in optimization, right? So how do you maintain the balance between simply using the solution that you found best so far or continuing to evolve that very minor ways, which is exploitation, or do you explore for brand new solutions in places you've never seen before? And this is kind of epitomized by something called the K-armed bandit problem. If we're allowed a limited number of trials at a slot machine that has not just one arm, but K arms, what is the best way to allocate our trials to maximize our overall utility, right? In other words, what's gonna give us the best possible payoff if we assume that each of those arms has a slightly different payoff than any of the others, right? Given finite computing resources, what is the best way to allocate our computational power to maximize our results is another way of framing the same problem. The classical solution that was discovered by Dubitz and Savage in a book that they republish as inequalities for stochastic processes. I don't like that title. I love the first title, which is How to Gamble If You Must. 
And in Dubin's and Savage in that first book, they basically showed that the best solution is you should allocate exponential trials to the best, exponentially more trials to the best observed distribution based on historic incomes. In other words, as certain solutions become better, you should allocate more and more resources to those. And that's essentially what it turns out the GA is doing. Imagine that those building bar blocks in the GA are arms of the bandit. And there's something called the schema theorem, which gets into more detail, that shows that the GA will do exactly what the classical solution requires. It will allocate increasingly more resources to the best solutions it's so far discovered. Um, and that is essentially in many ways why the GAs are uh, work, right? But when are they actually useful, right? That's a different question. First of all, if the space is highly linear, they're not gonna work very well. It's better to use something like regression or something that just manipulates individual bits over time to find the best solution. So the solution search space has to be highly nonlinear. In other words, there's parts where, there's parts of the search space that have a lot of fitness, a lot of good solutions, and parts that don't have very good solutions. You have to be able to create a genomic representation that can take advantage of the building blocks, right? If these different little pieces are gonna be spread over this genome no matter what you do, that's not gonna work very well. There needs to be a limited space of potential solutions. It can't be that the solutions are infinite, right? Because the GA needs to be able to explore that and you need to be able to write a description of that space in such a way that you can encode it in the genome. Uh, and the fitness function has to be computationally efficient, right? The GAs work because they run that fitness function a lot of times. They evaluate thousands of individuals from each population. They evaluate that population over multiple generations. If you don't have a computationally efficient fitness solution, it's not going to work very well, right? It's going to simply take too much time. So that's when GAs are useful. That's when they work out the best. And hopefully you have a better understanding of how genetic algorithms can help uh, solve problems.